Right. <laughs> so uh, th this sounded like a, an excellent idea when we discussed it in the pub the night before. <laughs> Clearly, you all get the joke at Pandora <laughs> Box. Um, now that I'm standing up in front of all of you uh, with lots online as well, it's not quite as funny as I thought it might be. <laughs> and it's got the small disadvantage that I, I've got no handholds in the box, so uh, Lydia, you're going to have to click through the slides. <laughs> Off you go. Great. So we're going to um, discuss some of the factors that we think lead to successful innovation uh, processes in the humanitarian sector, and particularly at MSF. Um, so the first one we've got is collaborating with others. Um, and our first example from MSF comes from a project designed to test the ther uh, thermostability stability of insulin, which we're going to hear about later in this session. Um, and the project team worked closely with two sets of people. Firstly, with field staff, field staff in order to um, measure the thermostability stability of insulin um, uh, in a real life environment. <coughs> And secondly, with Unige, um, which is a university in Geneva. And the team found that it was really important for each partner to have a clear and documented set of responsibilities um, and roles. OK. And uh, does anybody know what these little children are looking at? Well done. <laughs> so when drones first came along a few years ago, everybody thought, oh, that's fun. What, can we, what on earth can we use them for? And uh, congratulations to the chap somewhere in the audience who thought, let's transport uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis samples in Papua New Guinea, because that takes quite some mind-bending to have thought of that. Uh, it's a really good effort. So we encourage you to be curious and experiment. Otherwise, you'll never get anywhere. Lydia. So thirdly, resourcing the project. Um, so. For example, um, there was a project designed to test the use of uh, cholera vaccines for outbreak control. And in 2012, there was an outbreak of cholera in Guinea ahead of the rainy season, and MSF implemented a mass vaccination of 150,000 people. So the team had already written a concept note before the cholera outbreak, and that included information on what they wanted to do and what resources they would need. And that allowed them to quickly resource the project as soon as the outbreak occurred, and in particular, funding was made available for a project manager to be able to devote a significant amount of time to be in the field. Absolutely. OK, next one, ethics. Now, we've just spent the whole previous session discussing things linked to this. Um, this is uh, another um, electronic medical record style idea. Uh, and for them, it was protecting data. Uh, and uh, I think as medics, we grow up with, uh, with this. Me not, because I'm not a medic. But uh, as non-medics, we don't grow up with ethics. And so it's quite important to educate our non-medics about ethics. Uh, and that's why we build this framework for, for non-medics about <laughs> ethics. Um, and so I think it's a, a really important lesson learned over the last few years. And I'm glad we've locked it down in a publication, which we'll show you later on. So organizing the process. In 2015, um, MSF uh, designed and built an Ebola treatment center in Sierra Leone. And the project benefited from really strong project management processes that were taken from MSF's construction policy. So technical experts met for four days to work on the design, and each member was chosen to bring different expertise with very little overlap. Um, and as a result of that, the team was able to iterate through eight versions of the design in just four or five days. And they had regular check-ins um, with the field team to ensure that the design would work in the site location. Good oak. Uh, so th these are two. I'm now using words which uh, I got uh, nailed to the wall for using a two years ago. Business and functional analysis. Uh, and so MSF's not a business. Uh, we're an NGO, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what, what can we learn from the private sector regarding this? Well, um, business analysis and functional analysis are vital, uh, vital steps in the process of innovating in any project, et cetera. And uh, this was a good example. For those of you who recognize this, this was presented a couple of years ago. It's the Refresh project. Uh, it's about um, diagnosing uh, breakages in boreholes and repairing them as opposed to digging a new borehole. And they really thought hard about what their needs were and then uh, uh, the business analysis. And then they really uh, um, accompanied the kit to the field uh, and looked really hard about, you know, does it really work? Does it fit into the land crews? Can, can local staff actually use it? Um, so they, they ticked this box and with excellent results. And the project's scaling up now. So managing risk. 
Um, MSF is currently involved in a large uh, stage three clinical trial of a rotavirus vaccine. And the teams managed risks in four ways. One, by getting strong support from senior management. Um, two, by having a very detailed project management plan with um, Episantra. Um, third, by selecting a trial location um, in which Episantra already had um, a really significant presence. And fourthly, by ensuring that funding was flexible enough to meet needs as they changed. Uh, and so this is last year, um, uh, and uh, the message, um, and thank you very much, Peter, for once again uh, repeating this fantastic fail forward, fail fast, and learn from it. I managed to get, this is Ariane Heenkamp, uh, he's the general director of OCA, so one of the five most powerful people within the MSF movement, <laughs> standing up, uh, 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 um, and that wasn't a snipe at the international office, it's just reality. Uh, the, 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 this is, um, and the fact that, he can stand up as a general director and admit failure, personal failure. He took personal responsibility for a project that failed. I think it's really, it's a, it's a big deal. Um, and uh, so I also admitted failure on this. Uh, this is the uh, PDA, Ebola PDA. Uh, and I didn't know it had failed until quite a long time afterwards. And so it's, it's quite, yeah, I think it's important to fail forward fast. I think, and thank you very much for adding, Peter, the, uh, the notion of failing fast. Uh, it's really key. And our final factor is engaging end users. So in the last session, um, you heard about two e-care mobile applications. And um, one of the factors that has been really important in the success of those two projects has been regularly engaging with uh, health workers in the design and piloting um, of those two applications. All right. Great. And so uh, we can go forward. And we've got to, to be honest, I mean, you know, this is just our opinion. Uh, we're keen to hear your opinion. And so I'm not sure, uh, Kim, whether it's possible to pull up the, uh, the voting thing we're doing now. So you might notice next to you in your chairs, um, if you look behind your, sorry, on the right hand side, uh, you've got uh, under your right elbow, you've got a little keypad, a black keypad uh, with uh, one to nine. Uh, and we're interested to hear uh, what your experience was uh, of the nine things that we've just listed, which ones were the most important when innovated? Now, uh, don't vote yet. I think, uh, uh, are we ready to vote? Yep, yeah, we're ready to vote. Vote. Just one. And do we have the result, Kim? Give me a thumbs up. I can see behind the window. Just the number, or, uh, or just the number and enter, I don't know. Just the number. Ta-da! That's interesting. That's not what I expected at all. <laughs> That's very, and then bugger the risk. Let's just pile straight in there and just do it, get on with it. Nobody cares about the risk. I'm bored. <laughs> Oh, the ethics, I got the ethics, yeah. yeah. Uh, but that's very interesting. And in, I'm really happy that Engage with End Users came up really strong. Javid, big shout out to that one as well. I think it's, that's, um, that's, that's key, I think, if you don't talk to the end users as well. So that, that's very interesting. However, this is just uh, nine, so we wondered whether you might have others. But before we go there, um, Lydia, if you could hold up one of those pieces. I really am rather restricted. I think I might have to take my box off in a bit. Um, some of you under your chairs will have a piece like this. Uh, so everybody look under your chair or look under the nearby chair. And if you have a piece, hold it up. Okay, we got one over there, yeah, yeah. So those of you who have a piece of the puzzle, stand up and bring it to the front. Come down to the front. Uh, we'll have to have the lights on for this. To the front here, here. Here we will. Okay, and so can you build your puzzle? Come round to the front. So this, this is going to make an, a three by three, please. A three by three. You've got two minutes. Go. Don't. <laughs> This is going to make, obviously, an evidently tweetable photo. <laughs> and while they're doing that, I want the rest of you to think of other clever things to say that we may or may not have had earlier on. I have a pen and more bits of the puzzle. So think while they're doing this. 
Come on, chaps. Uh, missing one. So there's one underneath the chair somewhere. Look around. There's not people in every chair. <laughs> one more bit of the puzzle. Somebody's stolen a bit of a... <laughs> oh, oh, oh! No. Did I see at the back? No. Oh, yes, here we go. Peter, it's very appropriate, Peter, that you should find the last one. And let's, let's see which one is it. Which one is it, Peter? Uh, I can't see the rest of them, so you're putting me in a difficult position. Analysis. <laughs> All right. Well, give them a round of applause. Thanks very much. And uh, go ahead and take your photo. If we could, for the online audience, we might have to lift it slightly higher and so they can see what's going on. One, two, three, photo. Two, four, five, tweet. OK, now it's your go. What hands raised, please, if you would like to add things to this complex puzzle, Lydia, I think you can throw it down then. So I have a hand raised at the back there, a gentleman in the black shirt. I've got another one here in the middle, a lady in the uh, grey top. Off to the right, a gentleman in the grey shirt. So we'll take those three first. Starting at the back. Can't hear you, say it again. Scaling up. Scaling up. Adoption, implementation. Oh, that's three. Uh, I'm going to go for scaling up. Scaling you choose. Up. OK, thanks very much. OK, and then we come forward to the lady sitting in the middle there. Is somebody giving you a microphone? Uh, pragmatism, practicality of the pragmatism. hypothesis. Yeah. So there was an interesting presentation, uh, I don't know whether you saw it outside, uh, the Pathways chaps. Uh, they were talking about um, stick to the reality and not the plan. Uh, yeah, I think that's their catchphrase. And so I think you're absolutely right. Pragmatism is very, very useful when approaching these things. And I have to write these in a hurry. Um, can you take over the talking and I'll do the writing? Yeah. Okay, we had a, we had a third. Over there. Um, having a strong sponsor. Having a strong sponsor. It, the resources is one thing, the money. Having someone strong enough to defend it in front of people who might not let you go ahead is very important. Yeah, great. Thank you. OK, and um, sponsorship. OK, so a, a champion, somebody who's going to, at political level, uh, and provide you the resources you need to do it. OK, lots of hands over here. So we've got, uh, let's take um, the lady, OK, the just there. Um, uh, is there something about not giving up? Exactly, so persevering, uh, Perseverance. With, uh, potentially long time frames um, with some of these projects. And uh, that, that's very linked to the kind of fail forward. If you fail once, try, try and try again. So perseverance, excellent. Armand down the bottom here, wait for a mic before you shout. How about a clear <laughs> so uh, uh, that's supposed to be come out of the business analysis, uh, but uh, I think it's worth reinforcing uh, the notion of clear objective. Now, I saw that several presentations earlier this afternoon listed that as a, as a key point going forward, having a clear objective. Thanks very much. Great. Um, over in the front. What about the uh, cost? Cost? Mm. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know the this, this C word shouldn't be mentioned in MSF, but still. Well, uh, we're in this, we're spoiled with MSF. Let's admit it, money's less of an issue. Human resources to fill the gaps in the field. That's where the real challenge with MSF arrives. But I think, can I change it slightly and you know, change it to opportunity cost? Um, because if we spend nine million in one thing, then that nine million could be spelt somewhere else. And so I'd like to nuance that slightly. I think everything's going to cost time. Everything's going to cost money. That's normal. But we, we very rarely look at the opportunity cost. We very rarely look at what, where we could have spent that money perhaps more efficiently or more effectively to have a higher impact. Um, so there we go. But I think you're absolutely right. Great. Someone from this side? Yeah. We've got space for three more, so. Two. I've got objective here. Imagination. Mm -hmm. Does that go together with uh, uh, be curious and experiment? Um, um, to, have, to, to think 
They're, re they're related, I guess, but, it, but, but um, imagination is a step beyond. Curious. It's a step beyond to, to, to dream. Uh, and I, I liked uh, 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 the presentation, I think it was um, from the Amman Hospital, when, when you said nothing is impossible. Um, it's just a question of time and money so that you imagine the, the world uh, and, you, and you dream. Absolutely. Patient, cent patient or beneficiary or population centered. We have the end user center, but I think that was more aimed at the at the health uh, personnel. Absolutely. And not so much at the, You're absolutely at right. So when we thought about end users, essentially we were thinking about the people who are going to use these tools, and they are the MSF personnel. And you want to focus on on the uh, the beneficiaries at the end, and so the impact for the beneficiaries. Oh, that's it. Oh, we've run out of, uh, of uh, things to think. But the fact that there are still hands up uh, um, shows that there's no one answer for all of this. It's just uh, uh, this is this. I mean, there's, there's no one way of doing this. There's no prescription for this. Uh, and uh, but now, considering the microphone is near you, Estrella, uh, well, if you can come back again, I'd like you to ask again the question that you asked earlier, and then I'd like somebody in the audience to. Uh, um, give their opinion on how we might be able to solve it. Please, could you ask again the question you asked earlier? So do I ask it to you? Do I, okay. <laughs> Verbalize. So the, the question was how, how much, how many of these projects actually know about each other before they're presented at Scientific Day and how much of that conversation is ongoing during the product or the project development so that there's, if there's any synergies or if there's any Anything uh, that can be discussed, it, it is actually discussed while the product part, ugh, the product is being developed. Okay, and so uh, and and the the honest answer to that would have been that many of the people here today hadn't heard of the initiatives, the very similar, very parallel initiatives going on. And so I'd like to challenge uh, uh, the audience. And uh, in fact, you've got a follow up from that, Sarah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just wanted to note that we held a meeting on research issues in MSF today. So looking at how well research in MSF does at collaborating separately to innovation. And Nathan Ford um, had done a quick analysis and found that we're much more likely to collaborate with external organizations than with between operating centers in MSF. So here comes the dilemma. Uh, Christopher Stokes, our outgoing general director, he summed it up neatly. Um, we are asked to collaborate, but we're set up to compete with five operational centers. Uh, and. Uh, is this good? Is this healthy? Should we change the business model of MSF and go ICRC or UNHCR, where one ring to rule them all and in the darkness bind them? Or uh, should we allow things to continue in a slightly chaotic sifrité, uh, um, as they say in French, this healthy tension between the different operational centers? Uh, what do we think? I open it to the floor. It's possibly the most pertinent question asked. So thank you for that, Estrella. Oh, a tough one. I'm asking really quite serious questions here. Maya. Hi. I think uh, we should still continue to se as you said, because I think the diversity and, and, and the perhaps the, the competition is good. I, I strongly believe in that. However, I think we should be aware of what's going on. Uh, to be able to, at some point, and I think, especially in the innovation projects, we're trying to move towards that. There's a small kind of club, we're not a working group, and we try and talk to each other and to try and make each other aware of what's going on in, in the different operational centers to know the project. So, although it's, it's very much in its early days, uh, I don't know, Estrella, you asked the question of how many projects were aware. I think. Within a small group of people, some of the people were aware of the other projects, but it's clear that it has to be widened out, and I think we're perhaps moving towards that way, but I strongly believe in, in having a bit of the competition, the diversity. Okay, that's very clear, Maya. Thanks very much. Any other opinions, conflicting opinions, or further thoughts to that? Right in the back there, Clotilde. No, yes, I, I agree uh, with Maya, and that there needs to be room for maybe competition in early phases. But then also, we sometimes get frustrated not being able to more collaborate. I think that when we talk about risk taking um, setup so that we can innovate, I mean, taking the risk of sharing our work <laughs> is something I think would bring a lot of. of uh, uh, 
positive uh, impact into the project. And uh, that's something that now we would like to, to set up some intersection collaboration around uh, the project that we are, we are currently uh, leading in, in OCG, because uh, there are a lot of resources outside uh, that could uh, help us to get easier or faster at scale. And I think that I would love to, to, to get um, I mean, the input from the e-health unit that was settled in, uh, in, in Brussels, and I, I know that there's a lot of work done there, and I think we would be much more powerful if we managed to share. And, um, so yeah, yeah, thanks welcome. very much. And I think it takes quite a lot of courage to share, because when you're in your little project room, you can tell each other everything's going all right. Uh, but when you stand up in front of an audience like this, and you really expose yourself, and then you really challenge yourself. I really uh, enjoyed watching um, Megan McGuire and her team uh, from the e-health unit in Paris doing regular demonstrations of what they're doing as they go down the line. So they expose themselves not just once, uh, but as often as possible. Um, Megan, if you're in the audience somewhere, you can comment on that. Um, are you there? Uh, um, how did it feel, Megan, to stand up and expose yourself, not in the literal sense of the term, but uh, to, 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 to share on a regular basis uh, what you're doing and take the hits? Because you've taken hits, I know. I've, um, I've uh, held your hand at times when it's been tough. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's just our team that is doing this. I think there's a collective um, group who are attached to e-health and health information systems that um, where we meet on a quarterly basis and we share intersectionally a lot. Um, and it's happened organically and I think it's, um, there's quite a few people in this room that are, have participated in that process over the yeah. last several years where we have been able to collectively both make some successes and, and share and, and work across sections. Um, and we've also been able to um, identify where we've messed up. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, th I think there's, I mean, there's, there's a good 10, 15 people in this room who have at different times collaborated on this platform and we've, all together have taken different chances and risks um, of figuring out how far we can push each other and also how far we can support each other. And so I, I don't necessarily think we need to set up formal arrangements, um, but it is nice when you have a collective group of people who can come together and, and, and share and, mm. and want to share and, and engage. Um, and I would say, you know, the NTB project, it, there was a little bit of push because it was funded by Unitaid, but we were, we've been able to work across four sections and, and also through two other organizations um, in a very short period of time. And so we can do this, and, and we are doing some collaborations with our health information systems um, as well. So I, I, I don't think it's, n it's happening, it's just not happening in a formal or public way. Mm, good, okay, Pete? To take things further, just down here at the front, if there's a microphone kicking around. I think maybe it does need to be formalized slightly. I think a lot of the collaborations that happen, happen because people have personal relationships. Hmm. And if you don't have that network to start with, you don't know where to go. So we ran a workshop on, uh, on, on Thursday about commercial innovation partnerships, and there were people there that didn't know that other people in MSF met and talked about innovation issues, even though they're working on innovative projects. So I think it does need to be formalized, and there needs to be those access points into a wider network of Absolutely. people and not just projects. Absolutely. And I think that was one of the founding reasons to creating this day. Um, and here I look at Sarah and, and Kieran, and, I, and we wanted to get people together. And it's, it's not for nothing that there's, it's over two days, and so there's a possibility of beers and dinner uh, between the two days, because that's where these formal connections are made, hence the lunchtime as well. I don't know whether you'd like to further comment on that or uh, any other thoughts. Um, yeah, when this day was first suggested and it made sense to put it after the scientific day and to not try to silo innovation because th there was a lot of crossover and um, we all learnt in the editorial committee a lot from the research, learnt a lot from mm. innovation, the innovation learnt a lot from research and it's a continuum. So it doesn't make sense to create further silos but to build on those networks. Good. Okay. And so leading on to our, our I mean, just to show you that what we did, we need to just make it up. Um, if you can bring the, uh, the slides uh, um, back up. So there's three publications which you uh, feel free to read, which summarizes a lot of what's been said today. Uh, and I have to say that it's really reassuring that um, I've watched this day for three years now. And this year, I was really impressed by uh, almost all of the projects I could see really following this kind of advice that you see here. Um, and it kind of almost feels like job done uh, and move on. 
Uh, and so um, here's, an, here's an option for moving on next year. Um, another live vote question. I look up to Kim uh, to see whether this is going to be possible. If not, I'll just do it with raised hands. It's going to be possible. And so I'm guessing, Kim, keep your fingers uh, up or down. It's going to be uh, yeah, number one for yes and number two for no. And, and really, the statement is if we ran a failure fair, uh, the idea of, of celebrating failure as a mark of innovation, a risk taking, and learning at the Sci Days 2018, would you come? Uh, and this audience, this, this question has been asked to the online audience as well, so I'll share the result afterwards. And so uh, voting is open. Press one for yes and two for no. Off you go. <laughs> OK, that's pretty clear. Uh, and that's very similar online. Uh, online, it was even stronger. It was 95% uh, said they would come uh, to a failure affair, and 5% they wouldn't. Um, uh, I'm wondering, the next question is, is, is <laughs> Would you personally stand up here in front of the whole audience? Uh, and I don't have the voting thing, so you, I'll just raise your hands if you'd feel comfortable, because it's about, we talked about creating a comfort zone, a kind of a space where we can actually share without being cut down to pieces. Can you raise your hands uh, if you would feel comfortable standing where I am admitting failure? Oh, that's reassuring. <laughs> So we'll get people next year. So I, well, we'll see. Uh, nothing decided, but that might be a fun uh, direction to take. Because I agree with Peter, uh, um, innovation's been a bit done to death, the word innovation. And so let's move on and, uh, uh, and learning organization. Let's explore some other words. Great. Okay, doke. Thank you. Thank you. Time to move on. <laughs> <laughs>